uh, uh, right in the middle uh, and uh, a key part of the evidence uh, and that evidence is in the modern people uh, so in a sense like uh, when people talk about the price of houses it's all about location and uh, uh, Malaysia is in a central location um, but it's also much more importantly about people um, going back uh, briefly 1.8 million years ago <coughs> and the Lengong Valley, which is further south than Parag, uh, shown there. Uh, Professor Mokhtar uh, discovered the uh, clear evidence of a very large uh, meteoric impact crater in the Lengong Valley. And uh, around the edges of this crater were uh, bits of uh, melted uh, conglomerate rock uh, from the, the heat of the impact. And uh, several of these uh, had artifacts, including hand axes, uh, embedded in them. And the dating of that uh, impact crater was, was done by two different methods, and both came to around uh, 1.8 million years ago. Uh, so, evidence goes back a long way. Um, I will not dwell very long on these slides, uh, which were taken at the last meeting. Um, uh, a year or so after the, uh, uh, the discovery by uh, Professor Mokhtar of the, uh, the monumental site that we've been seeing uh, yesterday. Um, but uh, the, uh, some of the characters in this shot uh, down here, the press shot, uh, are at this conference. And I'd hope to see Jane Allen, uh, who did the first uh, archaeological walk uh, over the area, um, uh, but uh, maybe she'll be uh, here later on in the conference. Um, going back again to uh, uh, the Lengong Valley, uh, the, some time ago there was a discovery of uh, a culture known now as uh, the Tampanian culture and the coast of Tampan, um, characterized by um, unifacial, uh, big, uh, hobbled uh, chopper chopping tools, uh, which this is rather a bad picture, which I took up uh, with my video camera. That uh, what it's supposed to show is that these are worked, uh, these tools are worked on one side, and, and that flat surface there is the unworked size uh, side uh, where you've got the edge. <coughs> Now, these, this, this culture of uh, chopper topping tools with these uh, unifacial uh, large pebbles um, comes, goes um, up to about 4,000 years ago. So if we look at the dates, go to Tampan is uh, uh, the, the first uh, set of tools were found in association with the ash of the uh, Toba volcanic explosion at that time. Uh, then a 40,000 at Bukibunu, uh, we have uh, uh, another site with these tools, 10,000 uh, in another cave site, uh, and in 8,000. <laughs> finally at uh, 4,000 at uh, uh, Guam Harima, so Tiger Cave, uh, we find these tools in association with uh, the skeleton of an anatomically modern human, um, so-called Barak Man. And uh, the, uh, so that's, that's the only clear association with modern humans with these tools. Uh, but uh, that's of course all here in the Malay Peninsula. And uh, I'll show uh, very briefly again, these were comparison shots uh, on the posters at uh, the last, last meeting that we had here. Uh, you've heard a lot about this yesterday and uh, we'll be hearing more uh, I don't. I wouldn't pretend to give any informed opinion uh, and, uh, and description of this uh, magnificent uh, discovery. Um, but uh, the advances in terms of dating since the first uh, presentations have been very impressive in terms of datings, uh, particularly of the uh, evidence for iron smelting uh, going back two and a half thousand years. Um, and I think this is. Uh, magnificent achievement 
um, and uh, this, this is an evolving story. And, uh, the, uh, so I'm sure we're going to be hearing more about this in, in the future. Um, I'm sure everyone recognises this site, but this was taken in 2010. And um, uh, Professor Mokhtar there. It's rather a wide-angle lens. <coughs> it's distorted. Now, I'm not going to be talking, as I say, I'm not going to be talking about the archaeology. I'm going to be talking about something a little bit more about, and that's uh, using uh, genetics to trace migrations. And essentially, the there are two types of approaches to uh, uh, tracing uh, genetic migrations, and that depends on which part of our genome that, uh, that you use. Uh, one of these uh, is called genetic phylogeography. Now, to translate the Greek there, it's using our genes, um, making trees, that's phylos, geography, putting those trees on the map. And you can do that with two small parts of our genome, mitochondrial DNA, uh, which we all get from our mothers. And uh, the mitochondrial DNA doesn't get mixed and shuffled at uh, each generation. <clears throat> In other words, it doesn't get diced and spliced. And so one can reconstruct from point mutations, uh, which occur over the ages, you can reconstruct a tree of uh, human mitochondrial DNA uh, which goes back 200,000 years and you can lay that tree on the map. Its uh, advantages are that it's a datable tree, you can date the branches, it's directional, you can, direct, you can uh, show which direction the branches are going, they're coming from the root. Um, and it's geographically highly specific. Uh, the other part of our genome, which uh, is non-recombining, doesn't get uh, diced and spliced at every generation, is the Y chromosome, which only chaps have. And uh, the uh, Y chromosome is much larger than mitochondrial DNA, and it's much more geographically specific. Um, it's coming into its own now, but one of the big problems with it has been getting uh, accurate calibration. Uh, and that's, that's uh, happening now. Um, but most of what I'll be talking about today is uh, using mitochondrial DNA. Now, the other approach uh, is using population genetics, which is uh, what genetics has been about for the last 100 years or so. And, uh, and that's using lots of different markers uh, in our whole genome, uh, in, in our nuclear DNA. Uh, which is by far the bulk of the DNA that we have. It's, uh, um, the big problem with uh, nuclear DNA is that it does get diced and spliced at every generation, and so you can't reconstruct trees. Um, what you can do is to use those specific markers to compare populations mathematically and reconstruct hypothetical uh, a mixing of populations and splitting of populations. Uh, but its uh, problem is it's more difficult to date and uh, it's uh, non-directional because what you're looking at is associations and the associations don't necessarily give you a direction of movement. And um, they, uh, but it's actually very highly sensitive because it's, it's, uh, it's the bulk of our DNA, and it's many, many loci. That's, there are many, many genes that you can test to compare. And uh, that's very useful if you're looking for uh, small amounts of mixture uh, where you know exactly what you're looking for. And that's the situation when we're looking at uh, Neanderthal mixture or Denisovan mixture. And uh, these are archaic humans that uh, non-Africans, people who came out of Africa, um, mixed with um, 60 or 37,000 years ago, and possibly even more recently. Uh, so uh, that's the method. Now, going back to genetic phylogeography, what you need is a detailed gene tree or network. Um, as I say, use mitochondrial DNA or Y chromosome and you look at the geographic distribution of those gene lines. You can date the branches by uh, look, 
hunting the twigs, basically. It's the diversity, the bushiness of the, the gene lines, which is used to estimate time depth. Plant analysis uh, looks at branches which have moved from one area to another and form new founder events. And uh, because we have so many different branches in any population, you have to look at the movement of multiple branches. And uh, the founder analysis uh, uses the tree and looks at the movement of multiple different lineages. And the best example of uh, using uh, phylo genetic phylogeography geog with uh, mitochondrial DNA is uh, the, looking at the whole human uh, history in terms of mitochondrial DNA, and that's shown in uh, summary form here. Uh, these uh, little disks here don't actually represent gene types, they represent clusters of gene types and they're color coded. The green ones are African and uh, the root of the tree is in Africa uh, and it's about 200,000 years ago and uh, the big disk to the right there is the rest of the world and the uh, the rest of the world belongs to one twig of one branch of the uh, African mitochondrial DNA tree. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to see any uh, way in which that single branch uh, means anything but the fact that uh, there was a single successful exit of modern humans from Africa which went on to populate the rest of the world. And so the uh, twig that went over was uh, from African branch L3. And uh, there were probably other twigs that went over, but they didn't survive uh, uh, the genetic drift of the first founding event. And that, uh, those uh, L3 branches uh, split up and they're color coded here again. And so that uh, we have uh, Indian South Asia in red, East Asian in blue, and European and Levantine, that's West Eurasian, in yellow. And uh, depending on where each individual in this population come from, uh, they will be uh, in a place on this tree. And that tree can be dated. Now, we're looking specifically here at uh, Southeast Asia and uh, the role of uh, the uh, peninsula. It, there is general agreement uh, that there was uh, a fairly rapid migration along the coast of the Indian Ocean. Uh, whether or not they went right round uh, the tip of India or across uh, taking the rivers uh, in uh, northern India, up the Indus and down the uh, Brahmaputra or the uh, Yanks, the um, Ganges. Uh, uh, we don't know, but uh, the, we can count the founding branches on that route out of Africa. So uh, if we look at the founding branches, unique founding branches in India, there are 26 of them. 